Thank you. Awesome. And yeah, I'll start by saying again, Jose, uh, thanks for thanks for inviting me. And you know, Cook Pad treated me very well. I got a Spanish omelette. We won't talk about where, how it no, went. No, no, no. no, no. no, no. It, we got a spa I got a Spanish omelette. It was perfect, and it was made by Jose himself, and it was fantastic. <laughs> amazing. Um, okay, cool. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm here to talk about MLOps on the edge or how to cheat at card games. There's going to be a little bit of overlap actually with the, the previous talk from Ultraleap. Um, it'll be interesting to compare notes on, on approaches a little bit later too. So I'll start by just introducing Fuzzy Labs because we're probably not so well known around here. Actually, this is also my first time in Bristol. So we're a Manchester based company and we are nerds, we are engineers, data science specialists, and what we have in common is we're all passionate about open source MLOps. So we work with data science teams, machine learning teams, to help them understand how they can do what they do better. Be that deploying models more efficiently, or automating training processes, monitoring models, all of these good things that we call MLOps. That's what we do at the core. And we focus very much on open source tooling to do that. So rather than saying, okay, you know, um, ClearML was said earlier, so I'll, I'll name, I named ClearML only because it was said earlier, you know, that, that would be something that we wouldn't work with, but in, instead, you know, we'd build something out of open source tools that does something equivalent. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is two things. What do I mean by the edge? And secondly, this little game we did to play the game Dobble, which I'll explain on the edge, um, just show you how we did that, what journey we went through, things we learned about the unique challenges of doing MLOps for the edge. Um, Clifton Suspension Bridge, an attempt to make some kind of edge-based pun. <laughs> Don't know if it's, yeah. I tried, right? Okay, fine. So what's edge-based computing? Well, I'm gonna define it and leave it up for people to disagree with me. It's typically small, low powered hardware, which is deployed close to a data source. And that last part is pretty crucial for the definition. So it's things like smart thermostats, where what we want to do is have a device which can monitor temperature and react to it in real time at the locality where, it, where that sensor data comes from. Or maybe smart speakers, smart doorbells, lots of things that begin with smart. But there's also dumb things, right? So maybe monitoring manufacturing processes or monitoring for security purposes. I've got two examples of edge devices here and they span a wide range of computational power. So on the left, we've got an Arduino Nano. This is a very low powered device. I'll show you the specs in a second, but it's very much very close to embedded. It's not, none of these things are true embedded really because we've got a little bit of abstraction from what I'd consider embedded, but still it's pretty low level versus the Jetson Nano, which is basically a small computer with a GPU that you can run Linux on. Let's have a look at the, no, what have I done there? Sorry. Let's have a look at the specs. Well, so uh, you can see what I mean, right? So on the left, we've got one extreme, which is one megabyte of flash memory, 256 kilobytes of RAM, a pretty underpowered processor and some rather low level IO. Now, if you don't know what any of these terms mean, don't worry too much. They're just low level, like input output protocols, ways of interfacing with things. On the right, it's a lot more familiar. We've got a decent amount of RAM. We've got an SD card, so we can have as much static memory as we like. We've got a decent CPU, four core ARM Cortex. And in addition to those low level, interfaces, we also have USB, we have Wi-Fi, nice luxuries like that. And we can program it with anything. The Arduino Nano, we program in C, we use the Arduino API, we have to. And basically you load your program onto the Arduino and that's what it runs. It doesn't have a sense of multitasking or anything like that. So that's much more akin, I'm gonna suggest to the sorts of things we saw in the previous talk. So I guess the, the, the point to take home here is that the word edge can contain a huge range of different hardware capabilities. So we have to be specific about what we mean. And actually at Fuzzy Labs, we've done some work on both of these platforms. 
the very low level stuff I can't really talk about, which is why I'm going to talk about an R&D project that we did on this, this Jetson Nano, where we've, we've got some quite fun stuff going on there. OK, well, why would we even want to do this? Because, you know, it's kind of challenging. The hardware is constrained, of course, and it can't be upgraded easily. That's pretty crucial. It's not like we can just go, you know what, I need more compute for my inference, so I'll spin up a bigger GPU, or I'll spin up another 10 servers. You've got the hardware you've got, and you're limited to that. I mean, you can upgrade it, but you have to upgrade many, many instances of it, and they're deployed in the world. And monitoring and updating those models across many devices, that's difficult, especially if network is unreliable, or if things about the device make it difficult to interact with and control once you've let it go. Why would we want to do it? Having seen the, the last talk, I kind of want to replace these three bullet points with Ultra Leap. <laughs> because basically, well, I think that that was exactly the compelling use case. That kind of emergent technology where what we really want is the ability to run really cool models to do really cool things in real time on the hardware. It's no good doing that kind of inference in the cloud because the network latency to actually do it would, would make the product unusable. So that's the kind of application where you want to do this despite it being difficult. And because we can, because that's always a good reason, right? <laughs> well, let's dig into these challenges a little bit more. Um, so these are just a few. This is not an exhaustive list by any means. But uh, let's start with training. So we maybe we have a training data set and we want to train a model which we can run on one of these devices. Well, the first question is, does the data set we have represent what we're going to get from the sensors on our target hardware? Maybe, the, maybe we're using cameras on the target hardware and, you know, the resolution on the camera is poor or there's something about the lighting that's going to affect it. These sorts of things. Have we taken these characteristics into account? Uh, will, will, will it fit into the target hardware's memory? That seems pretty, pretty fundamental. We've had some great fun with this, where we, we trained what we thought was a really trivial vision model, and we tried to deploy it to this, the Arduino, in this case. And we said, wow, it's 10 times bigger than the memory of the Arduino, and that's the most trivial model we can think of. So that kind of thing is pretty tough. Um, and once you've managed to make it small enough, will it still perform? Because you do things like quantization, which was mentioned earlier in a question, where fundamentally we're throwing away information about the neural network we've trained in order to make it fit on the hardware. That means we're potentially throwing away performance. And then we've got deployment. So how do I run the model on the hardware? Maybe we need to use some specialized frameworks for this. There's tools like TensorFlow Lite, which, which we've been using for doing that. It's designed for running these tens a TensorFlow model on a constrained hardware, uh, such as the Arduino. And how do I update it post-deployment? How do I, once it's out in the world, how do I keep it going? How do I send updates and renew it and things like that? And then the flip side of that, which is monitoring, right? So how do I know it's working at all? That seems to be the fundamental thing, baseline. Um, and how do I capture metrics, data drift, concept drift, across um, perhaps a vast distributed system, effectively, of things that live in the world. OK, fine. So it's hard. We've, we've kind of, you've kind of got the point now. However, despite that, let's, um, let's play around with it a little bit. So Dobble. I need to tell you what Dobble is first. Some of you will know what Dobble is. Um, it's a card game. You have to find the matching symbol. I've left these cards up for way longer than they would be left in a real gameplay scenario. So has everybody found the matching symbol? Has anyone not found it? OK, good. Right, so it's the snowflake. If you didn't get that, then the AI will definitely beat you. Um, I'm not very good at this kind of game, just to say. Anyway, OK, so this was an R&D project that we put together at Fuzzy Labs. And it was, it was partly a way to explore what's possible, push the boundaries a little bit, see which tools worked, which didn't work, what techniques worked, and which ones didn't. It was partly to have something to talk about, because as I said, some of the stuff we've been doing on the edge for real customers is stuff that we can't really talk about. Um, but also because ZML, our friends who maintain this wonderful open source training, no, I shouldn't say training, um, coordination 
work, uh, workflow management platform, let's call it that, um, they were running this competition, MLOps, a month of MLOps competition. And yeah, I mean, I'm pretty pleased to say actually the team, our entry actually won the competition, which was great. So what did we do? Well, we prepared and labeled our own data set. We trained a model. We tested it against humans. My co-founder, Tom, tested it against his children. And maybe at the end, I'll show you the video of that. Um, it, did, it did. So Tom can't beat his children uh, at this game. He's too just, you know, the, the brain just doesn't, it, you know, you get to a certain age and you just don't think like that, right? Um, I, it's fine. It's fine. He won't mind. He won't mind. Um, but no, the model, the model is good, right? So the model will build, beat humans, even the young ones. Um, and yeah, we deployed it to this Jetson Nano. We attached a camera to the Nano. We thought about ways we could deploy it covertly so it could really let you cheat without anyone realizing you're cheating. Um, I'm going to kind of talk through the story, tell you some of the tools and techniques we used. And then at the end, uh, if there's questions, we can dive into specifics. I'll also provide a link to the repo at the end so you can have a look at the code yourself. All right, so we start with labeling. That's pretty fundamental to any machine learning projects and it's not really edge specific. But just for the sake of completeness, we'll talk about it. So every card has eight unique symbols and we had a data set of 570 cards. We didn't collect the data set ourselves. It's actually a publicly available data set that somebody else has prepared. That was very nice of them. What we did was to manually label all of the um, card images using label box. Other tools exist. There's a great list published by ZenML again, actually, of different data annotation tools. Uh, label box is the one we used. And we split the work among the team, of course, just to make it a little bit to go a little bit faster, but you know, it's tedious work, right? It's got to be done. Once it's done, then the inclination of the data scientist is to say, right, good, I've done my training, I'm sorry, I've done my labeling, now I can train a model, right? Let's actually have some fun. No. The MLOps police say no. Because, you know what, we, we can't just jump to training a model because we've not really thought about what this model will do in the context of a product. And sure, we're not really building a product for this, but suppose we are. Okay. Do we like the MLOps police? Because that was, that was a <laughs> you know, random idea this afternoon. So let's see if it makes it into future, future versions of this talk. Um, all right, well, what kind of thing do we want to build? I suppose what we want is an interactive player. So it would be nice if we could have the Nano act as a player of the game. We'll present it two cards, we'll put them down on the table, we'll have the camera looking down at the table, and what we want it to do, as soon as it knows what the matching symbol is, it should announce it. Initially, it can announce it on the text terminal, later on, maybe we'll add speech synthesizer to it, and hey, maybe we can embed it into something like a teddy bear so we can play it covertly. Oh, actually, it turns out the Jetson Nano heatsink emits an enormous amount of heat, so no, we're not, we won't actually do that, but... It's a nice idea, right? Okay, well, let's, let's sketch out that solution a little bit then. And I do think that this is a pretty important thing to do when thinking about building machine learning powered products rather than doing machine learning for the sake of machine learning. We really need to think about where that model sits in the wider context. So what are we gonna do in order to build this um, hypothetical product? Well, Maybe what we want to do is first isolate the cards. So we'll have an image of two cards on a table. Let's suppose it's ideal conditions. You know, we've kind of set ourselves up for success here by placing the camera in good light with a direct view down on the, on the table. And we're going to just use maybe standard computer vision techniques, nothing clever, just to pull those cards out of the scene and separate them into two images. What we'll do next is put each image through a model, which we haven't trained yet, but having trained it, what we expect is the model will give us back a list of all the symbols it sees. Finally, all we need to do is find the common symbol. So we'll take the set intersection. We've got a set of symbols from one card, set of symbols from the other card. We'll combine them and find the common one. Fair enough. Which means finally we can talk about the model. So. We thought about this a little bit. Um, there, there's a bunch of different options you can go for here. 
the, the problem we're trying to solve here, from, the machine learning problem we're trying to solve here is object recognition. So we're trying to pull all of the objects that we can see from the image. There's two common approaches here. There's YOLO and SSD. Um, you only look once in the single shot decoder. There's probably other things as well. Doesn't particularly matter for, for our purposes. But if I can summarize these, with YOLO, you can handle high throughput. So we could potentially get good inferences, decent inferences on a high frame rate video feed. But the accuracy may not be perfect, may not be very good. Whereas with the single shot decoder, we actually, we can't hand, it, it takes longer to do an inference. So we can't handle a high frame rate video. We can't do 30 frames per second. Fine, but we can get much better accuracy. So actually thinking about it, that one's the one we want because we don't really need our, our device to be able to handle 30 frames per second video or even 10 frames or five frames per second. You know, once per second is probably enough really. Okay, so we went with SSD and we also picked a pre-trained model to build it on. So we picked mobile net um, because now coming back to the edginess of this problem, we're dealing with not very much memory. Nano has an all right amount of memory, fair enough, but even so, you know, smaller we can make this, the better. So that's why we went with that. Um, which brings us now to the training pipeline, and this will be a pretty uh, whirlwind tour of various things, so you know, details we can go into separately. Um, but okay, so you know what, the training process for a vision model is typically going to be pretty intense, so it kind of makes sense to say, actually, we can do that in the cloud. We have the flexibility of scalable compute. So no matter how intensive that process is, if we're willing to pay for it, we can provision as much compute as we need, get the job done, and at the end have a model. And a similar comment was made earlier as well in the previous talk, which is that your, if your deployment environment is one where your resources are constrained, then you're happy to pay extra if it means you can get a better, smaller model to deploy to the edge. So that's the kind of philosophy there. Of course, this model doesn't actually take much compute, fair enough, but you know, a real one might. might. A more interesting real world model may. Uh, so we specified the pipelines using a tool called ZenML. Um, I imagine some people here are familiar with ZenML, but I'll just provide a description for those who aren't. It is one of the many, many open source tools for, let's say, machine learning orchestration, pipelining, um, these kinds of things. Where ZenML differs, one of the way, one of the places ZenML differs is that you have this notion that you define your pipeline, you define the steps required to train your model or do whatever it is you're trying to do and the order in which they run, but you don't have to specify where you're going to execute it. So you can run your pipeline on Kubeflow, you can run it on SageMaker, on Vertex, on raw Kubernetes and a variety of other things. And they're continuing to add more and more runtime environments. So that's quite useful. And we actually use NML on a lot of our projects because it means that we can, for, for any of the variety of different customer environments we deal with, we can say, okay, yeah, well, we can write a pipeline that encapsulates what you do and run it in the environment that you already use. So if you're using SageMaker, fine. If you're using Kubernetes, that's fine too. So that's quite useful. Um, and then what else is there to say? Well, we push the trained model to MLflow so that we can have it ready for deployment. And I'll talk about deployment in a second. MLflow is a couple of things, but primarily it's an experiment tracker and a model registry. The idea is that every time we train this model, we'll log an experiment to MLflow, which helps with collaboration and with reproducibility because we can go back in history and say, okay, you know, this is the model that Matt trained yesterday. These were the parameters he used. This was the data set he used and so on and so forth and reproduce it. But what we can also do, of course, is say, at some point, this experiment is something we'd like to release to production. So we will store that model in the model registry. And having been stored in the model registry, it's now ready for deployment. The way we do that depends on the application. Um, but I'll tell you what we do in a moment because we've got a large diagram of the pipeline. I'm not gonna go into all of this because, you know, there's far too much here, but let's just kind of look, give you a rough idea of what the pipeline looks like here. 
So there's a couple of different stages to it. We have a data pipeline which just prepares our data set ready for training and stores that data set in S3. Um, we're not using any data version control thing here like DVC or anything like that. We could do, but you know, this was prepared for a competition with a time, time limit, so we, we left that bit out. Um, and then once the data set is stored, we can run the training pipeline. So we can run the pipeline many times over the same data set. We can update the data set independently of the training pipeline. That's quite useful. Uh, we'll evaluate the model, and if we're happy with the performance, we'll convert it to our Onyx format, which is what we're going to use to package the model, and we'll push it up to our model registry. Actually, this diagram is a little bit misleading because every experiment gets recorded to the experiment tracker, but not every experiment becomes a model in the registry. So the arrows should be a little bit different, but never mind. Finally, we can talk about deployment. Here's a couple of our team experimenting with a prototype. And yeah, I mean, it kind of worked 50% 50, 50 of the time, and then we just improved it a little bit and got it to somewhere where it was pretty decent. Um, yeah, so all the trained models are stored in ML flow. That's our model registry. But what we also do is have a Docker container that runs on the Jetson Nano. And its job is to just keep an eye on the, well, its job is to run the model, but its job is also to keep an eye on the ML flow instance and see if there's a new version of that model. So if it sees a new version, it will pull it down from, um, from MLflow and then restart the served model. So we've got the new version running. The served model just receives video feed and outputs in text the inference. Um, and as I say, it's packaged in Onyx. We're also using this TensorRT, which is a tool from NVIDIA for doing inference on this hardware. Um, there's lots of detail on how we've done all of that in the repository and the associated blogs. So if you're interested, definitely worth reading that. Uh, okay, again, you know, a little bit more detail on how this deployment actually looks. So what have we got here? Two components, right? So we've got the cloud on the right, we've got the hardware on the left. So in the cloud, we have to run two things permanently. One is the MLflow server, where we track our experiments, where we do our model registry as well. The second is ZenML server. So ZenML needs a server that it can communicate with so that it can then orchestrate the pipelines wherever you happen to be running them. Um, so we provision both of those. Also worth noting that another thing ZenML provide is what they call stack recipes. So this is a set of Terraform definitions that basically allow you to deploy the server plus whatever else you're, you're using which in our case includes MLflow. And you can basically say, okay, I want this stack, deploy it to my environment and it will stand everything up for you. That's pretty cool. Um, and then on the hardware side, we have our Docker container running on Linux, on the Jetson Nano. The Jetson Nano is an ARM platform, that's worth noting. So, you know, if you've, you've got something that's been built for x86 platform, it's not just gonna run on ARM, you, there's a little bit more work to do there, but it's not anything that's too difficult to deal with. Um, inside Docker container, we have this script that just fetches models from the MLflow server. And then we have this service, which will yeah, start the, yeah, download new model, start the server, and then we'll just sit there and listen for images and output the inference. And that's pretty much it. So source code is here. I've provided a very large QR code for you. So you don't have to remember that URL. So, um, but ask me afterwards as well if you want that link. And then I'll just leave you with this final slide. So I always like to promote this thing because we're specifically op have an open source focus and, and open source ethos in everything we do. We maintain this list, which is called Awesome Open ML Ops. So it's a GitHub repository of what we think are the best in breed open source tools for doing ML Ops, various categories of ML Ops. Now, have a look. If there's anything missing, undoubtedly there is, then please raise a pull request. Let us know about it. I also say we're hiring. 
Um, so yeah, have a look at the roles on fuzzylabs.ai. Talk to me afterwards if you're interested. Um, yeah, we're, we're always looking for talent at every level as well. And yeah, if you want to talk about MLOps, then here's the email address, but I'm here as well for the rest of the evening. So yeah, thank you.